Welcome to our channel. Today we will dive in a rather aggravating case and talk about how jealousy and revenge can be the root of evil. We will talk about the murder of Adrian Jones. Her full name was Adrian Jessica Jones. She was born on June 18, 1979, in Mansfield, Texas. Her parents are named Bill and Linda, and she also had two brothers, Justin and Scott. Their family moved to Mansfield in 1984 from the Dallas area, and they did that because they wanted to raise their kids in a smaller town environment. They wanted to get out of the city of Dallas as it was growing a lot at that time. Adrian's father, Bill, was a very protective parent, especially of her being his only daughter. So, of course, like a lot of protective parents when she started getting older, Bill started putting more rules into place to keep her safe. They gave her a strict 9 p.m. curfew. And if she ever went to like a fair or a concert, she always had to bring back a ticket stub to show proof of where she went. But like with many teenagers, this only made her want to break the rules more. At some point, her father suspected that she was sneaking out at night. He decided to nail her windows shut. And I think he was just worried because he knew that Adrian was very pretty. She was a popular girl, but she really had it together. She was in advanced honors courses and spent hours studying after school every day. She was very determined. She was on the soccer team, but eventually she got a knee injury and she decided to switch to a different sport. She chose to participate in cross country. She really excelled at that. She was very fast. And not only was she very smart and excelling in sports, but she also worked 20 hours a week at a fast food restaurant. It was called Golden Fried Chicken. And when she was working there, she was known as a reliable employee who made work more fun for everyone. She had a stellar work ethic too. And she also managed to keep up a social life. Adrian had tons of friends. She was a social butterfly. She met people in school and at work, on cross country, and then also met people from different states through cross country as well. One of her teammates said that she was the type of person that would say hi to anyone. She was always making small talk when in a small room with someone or in an elevator being friendly and cheerful just seemed to come naturally to Adrian. And she also liked boys. And one of her close friends said that she was a big flirt but wouldn't go more into detail about what that meant. And as Adrian got older, she got more into makeup, hair, fashion, and she would spend hours sometimes getting ready to leave the house. Even if she didn't have a date or an important event to go to, she always tried to look her best when she left the house, because she said, you never know who you might meet. In fall of 1995, their team was preparing for regionals, which was going to be in Lubbock during the first week. In November of 1995, their team piled into a large van for a five-hour drive from Mansfield to Lubbock. Their team did well, and the trip was uneventful as far as drama or gossip, any fights between people. And none of that happened. Everyone got along really well, according to teammates. And they all went back to high school. Once they got back to the high school, Adrian got a ride home with a friend. Adrian got dropped off at home after they got back from the meet. Everything went on as normal after this until December 3, 1995. It was a Sunday evening. And that night around 10.30, Adrian got a phone call. It was her boyfriend at the time, Tracy Smith, who went to another high school and he had just been out of town. Adrian's parents said that she could talk to him, even though they normally didn't like her to be on the phone that late at night. She's on the phone with Tracy, and her mom is kind of listening in while she's doing some things upstairs. At some point, her mom, Linda, heard Adrian switch the phone line over to another call. She talked to somebody else for about a minute, and then switched back over to Tracy. She finished her call with Tracy saying goodnight to him. And then her mom came in and talked to her, and she asked who called in while you were on the phone with him? Adrian said, Oh, that was David from Cross Country. He was upset about something. Linda didn't know who David was, and she didn't think much of it. But about ten minutes later, she went back into Adrian's room, and she noticed that Adrian seemed unsettled. She just seemed to be very anxious and thinking about something clearly. But her mom said goodnight to her, and she went to bed. The next morning at 7 a.m., Linda was woken up by one of her sons asking where Adrian was. At first, Linda assumed that Adrian went running before school. This was something she would do sometimes. But when she went into her room, she realized her running shoes were still there. Her mom knew there was a possibility that she had sneaked out. It was something that she had done before, but she had always come back before morning. Later that morning when Adrian didn't go to school, 
Her parents called 911 and reported her missing. Adrian had an address book. Linda got that out and started contacting everyone she could that her daughter was acquainted with. At some point, she talked to Adrian's cross-country coach, and she thought it was a good opportunity to ask him about David, the guy that Adrian had said that she spoke with on the phone briefly that Sunday night. Her coach said the only David on their team was David Graham, but he didn't really think the two of them were friends. The next day at school, the cross-country coach told another student to go talk to David and ask him if he had talked to Adrian that night. And that kid said that David seemed confused and said, No, why would I? They started thinking, you know, maybe Adrian just used the name David to cover up for who she was actually talking to. It was now December 4th. Adrian had been missing for at least 24 hours at this point. And later on, that morning, a farmer was just driving down along rural county road near Joe Pool Lake in Grand Prairie, Texas, about 10 miles from Mansfield. And he actually came across Adrian's body. At first, he thought maybe it was a prank or a setup. He stayed back for a little while and just watched her. And then when he noticed she wasn't moving, he went ahead and walked over there and confirmed that she was dead. Someone had clearly beaten her. Her head was caved in on one side and she'd also been shot twice, once in her forehead and once in her cheek. As soon as the farmer realized that this was a body, he called 911. Adrian was dressed in a sweatshirt and shorts, but had no shoes on. And they also found two shell casings near her body. The medical examiner was able to determine that she died around 1 a.m. the night before. Of course, everyone in the town wanted to know why Adrian. Was this a sexual assault? But the medical examiner also said there was no sexual assault involved. Her father, Bill, had to go and identify her body. The whole town, all of her friends, their extended family in other states were all devastated and confused. Why did this happen to 16-year-old Adrian? Who would want to see her dead? I mean, here she's this beautiful young girl, and she's found in this really wackety place out in nowhere land, and she's been shot in the face and bludgeoned in the back of her head. And you don't know why. What did this young 16-year-old little girl know or do? It caused you to hate her that much. My husband had to go with the detectives and identify her body. And I called all my family, and, and I can still hear their voices saying, No, you're wrong. And uh, it was the truth. She had been shot and murdered by somebody. No one could figure out why. So, of course, investigators looked into Adrian's life, looked at her house, her room. There were no signs that Adrian had been abducted from the house. It seems like she left on her own. For someone to leave their home willingly, most likely it's going to be with someone that they know. And it's hard to narrow down who this person could be because Adrian had so many friends. She had a very wide circle. Investigators said that there were literally hundreds of potential suspects, and they had to thoroughly go through them all. They started just casually interviewing people at the high school, and then making lists of people they actually wanted to bring in and interrogate. There were several students that they wanted to bring in for a lie detector test. Her brother said that he had seen a pickup truck that night. Therefore, the police tried to narrow down any students that had pickup trucks. Their small community was absolutely shocked by this murder. And just how gruesome it was. The fact that the person still out there was freaking everyone out thinking what if this is a serial killer who's going to kill more students? Her classmates, of course, were brokenhearted over this. They had to bring in guidance counselors to talk a lot of them through the grief. A bunch of students at the school got together and they planted a tree in Adrian's memory on the soccer field, like right next to it and people also wore ribbons around in honor of her memory. When counselors were working with a lot of the students, they noticed that a lot of them were repeating the same thing. They had heard that the killer was one of their classmates, and that they were still just walking around the school, trying to act normal. And Adrian's friends were really freaked out because they felt like maybe this killer had something against all of them, and maybe they were next. Meanwhile, Linda and Bill are desperate to find answers about what really happened to Adrian who she really talked to that night. They were talking to as many classmates as they could, as many of their friends trying to dissect the rumors, figure out what was true, what was not. And at some point, she even contacted a psychic and tried to get help that way, but nothing really came out of that. As investigators are working their way through the long list of people that could have potentially done this to Adrian, her mom, all along had a feeling that it was David, 
the boy that Adrian said she was talking to that evening. David Graham was a senior at the time. He was 18 years old, and he wasn't even on detectives' radar really because Adrian didn't even have him in her address book. And they figured that he and Adrian weren't close enough for him to be really considered suspect. Plus, her friends said that she had nothing to do with David Graham and they didn't think they were even close acquaintances, but they both were on the cross-country team. And her saying that she had talked to him the night before, of course put him on their interview list. Let's talk more about David Graham. David Christopher Graham. He was born on November 2nd, 1977. He's a little older than Adrian. But even though he was older than Adrian, they did have a lot in common. They were both excelling in academics and athletics. David was very popular. He was well-liked and Adrian may have been interested in that. One of his classmates actually described him as one of the coolest people left on earth. David was actually a battalion commander in the junior ROTC program and planned to go to the Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs as a first step to his future career as a fighter pilot. This was a career he wanted to do when he was just seven years old. When David talked to investigators, he said that he and Adrian were just casual friends and he hadn't talked to her in a while, but he was very upset about her death and actually cried openly in front of them about how emotional he was feeling about it. And while several other people on their suspect list were given polygraph tests, for some reason, they decided that David didn't need to take one. And not only that, they ended up just clearing him as a suspect. Meanwhile, they're focusing on their first real suspect, a girl named Tara. Now, apparently Tara isn't her real name, but she just is referred to as Tara in this case. But this girl, Tara had a history of violent behavior. In one incident, she shot her boyfriend and seriously wounded him. And another time, she actually attacked one of Adrian's friends with a baseball bat because she thought her boyfriend was sleeping with her. She ended up breaking this girl's cheekbone and gave her a concussion all because of jealousy. So that tells you a lot about her. Maybe she could have been involved. Adrian's friend had filed a restraining order against Tara and Adrian testified in court. The police thought maybe she would after Adrian to get her back because she actually said in court, I'll get you for this. Most of the rumors at school were centered around Tara. At this point, most people thought that she was the killer, but as detectives looked more into her, they realized that her alibi was rock solid. She was able to prove that she could not have killed Adrian. They also cleared Adrian's boyfriend, Tracy Smith. Although Bill and Linda, her parents were still very suspicious of him because they thought it was weird that he never contacted her parents after the news broke that she was found dead. And they thought that was really odd and cold. But Tracy passed a polygraph test and also led them to their next suspect, 17-year-old Brian McMillan. This guy Brian used to visit Adrian all the time when she would work at a local subway restaurant. Others said that he just creeped her out. According to her friends, he became obsessed with her, started following her around. And any time that he would come into the subway, she would literally hide. Tracy, her boyfriend claimed that he was actually Brian, that she was talking to that night on the phone. It's very confusing because that's not what she told her mom. But Tracy said that when she clicked back over to him, she said that it was Brian and that he was upset. When the police talked to Brian at first, he said that he didn't even know Adrian, but after more questioning, he admitted that they did know each other and that they were friends, which, who knows what Adrian would have said about that. He said that the night that Adrian was killed he drank a lot, because he was depressed that all his friends had girlfriends. He said it was the first time he drank in six months, and he was blackout drunk. He doesn't know if he talked to Adrian or not. He said it was possible. He could have even gone over to Adrian's house. Anything was possible because he was drunk. The police ended up arresting Brian. Not long after Adrian was killed December 15, 1995. And right away, tons of Brian's friends came forward in his defense saying that he was not a violent guy. He would have never done something like this. His father also said that on the night that Adrian died, he was home. And he was sure he never left. But they put him in jail. And he was there for three weeks. And while he was in there, he took a polygraph test and he passed it. And the person who gave it to him said that he passed it with flying colors. At that point, he was immediately released, and Brian's family ended up suing the city for an undisclosed amount for the whole thing. So maybe Tracy was confused about who Adrian had talked to that night, or maybe for some reason, Adrian just told Tracy that she was talking to Brian. At this point, detectives are back to square one. 
They have no substantial leads and no one that they're really looking at more than anyone else. So then nine months after the investigation began, two cadets from the Naval Academy in Annapolis, Maryland, came forward and said that their roommate had confessed to them that she had been involved in a murder. They said that they doubted that it was true, but she had given them so many details and seemed so serious that they felt like they had to report it. Now, this roommate is someone we haven't talked about yet, Diane Michelle Zamora. She just randomly told her roommates that she had committed the murder of Adrian Jones with her boyfriend, David Graham. Diane was born on January 21, 1978. She was raised in a very religious family. She was the oldest in the family and was oftentimes a caretaker for her younger siblings. Their family really struggled financially. There were times that their electricity would just be shut off and Diane would have to study by candlelight because she was a very determined person. She really wanted to be a NASA astronaut one day. She decided when she was very young and she woke up at 6 a.m. even before school, every day to study. In high school, she took honors courses and belonged to multiple clubs and organizations. And she also played the flute in the marching band. And just like David and Adrian, she also ran cross country, but she was way different than Adrian. She was introverted. She didn't socialize much. She wasn't really into makeup and fashion and really kind of stuck to herself. And she said before that the reason she didn't date is because most guys were too immature for her. She and David actually met when she was only 14 years old at a Civil Air Patrol meeting. They stayed in touch after that. And then they started dating their senior year in 1995. I've known Diane in Civil Air Patrol for about three years before we started going out. And I'd always known her to be a real bubbly, spontaneous girl. And I knew she was very smart, that she made straight A's in school. And she was real determined to get what she wanted. I knew that the relationship we had was too serious for that time in our life. And I tried to slow it down, but there was nothing I could do. I was infatuated with her and she was obsessed they with me. They were both very career-driven overachievers with high ambitions that hadn't planned on getting into serious relationships. But a month after they started dating, they announced their engagement and their wedding date. They planned to get married the summer right after college graduation in 2000. But they had a long-distance relationship for a little while because Diane got into the Naval Academy in Annapolis and David was accepted into the Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs. Staying faithful to each other meant a lot to Diane because she was determined to marry another virgin. Like I said, she was very religious. She was a virgin herself. She wanted to lose her virginity to her husband and only have slept with one person her whole life. And she planned for this person to be David. Her virginity was incredibly important to Diane. It was a big part of who she was. In the fall of 1996, Diane was a midshipman at the Naval Academy and David was a first-year cadet in U.S. Basics Air Force Cadet Training at the Air Force Academy. And everything for them was going according to plan. But this didn't last long because Diane, for some reason, decided to tell her roommates that she and David killed somebody and that she was basically proud of it. She was actually bragging to them about it, saying that that's how much David loved her. He would do anything, she said. And they said that she was very cold about it, saying that it had to be done. And according to them, the only time that she expressed any remorse about killing Adrian was being at Adrian's funeral and seeing her parents cry. And that made her feel sad. Detectives from Grand Prairie got this news. And they flew out to where Diane was right away. But when they interviewed Diane, she said that she made the whole thing up. She said she and David weren't involved in a murder at all. She just made it up to seem cool to her fellow cadets. As I spoke to her, told her why we were there and who we were, uh, I got no reaction whatsoever. I got uh, what uh, is sometimes referred to as the thousand-mile stare. She just kind of looked through us. But at least now they had a lead. They knew that someone wouldn't just make something like that up. The detectives went back to Texas and continued to work on gathering evidence against Diane and David. The Naval Academy actually asked Diane to go on a temporary leave while she was under investigation. And she was very upset about that, but she went back home to Texas. And then on August 31st, she flew out to Colorado Springs to see David and tell him, face to face, what she had done. She told him that she had told her roommates about what they had done. Civil and she Air had Patrol told them all meeting. slightly. They stayed in touch versions. after that, and then, then they started the dating their senior her, year. In she just denied the whole thing. David decided that he would just do the same thing. If they interviewed him, deny the whole thing. She told me that she had, she had told her roommate stuff. She, she had given him several different versions and 
But when the police came, she said she denied everything. So I thought, well, if the police come and talk to me, I'll just tell them I don't know anything. They questioned David on September 4th. And of course, he denies having any involvement with Adrian Jones' murder. When asked why Diane would make up story like that, then he just said, he didn't know. Maybe she was bored. The Air Force actually made him take a polygraph test, and he failed that. So that only heated things up more, and the interrogations began to get more intense. They questioned David, for two days, without a lawyer present, unfortunately. And they also told him that if he didn't confess to everything, he and Diane would likely get the death penalty. They were clearly trying to scare him into confessing. At some point they told him that if he just wrote everything down on a piece of paper, gave a written confession that they would go easy on him. Finally, David agreed, and he wrote out a four-and-half-page confession about what happened the night that Adrian died. It started with that regional cross-country meet in Lubbock. He said on November 4th, he gave Adrian a ride home. On the way home, they stopped at an elementary school in the parking lot and decided to have sex there. And David actually had the nerve to describe this sexual encounter with Adrian as short-lived and hardly appreciated. He said, right afterwards, he felt bad. And he decided to confess the whole thing to Diane. He went back and told her that night. And when she found out that he had slept with another woman and broke their promise to save their virginity for each other. After they were married, Diane was just beyond angry. She was livid that David had wrecked the purity of their future marriage that he had sex with somebody else. That was huge for her because she had actually started having sex with David already. Even though she wanted to wait until marriage, she decided at some point that it was just too hot to handle with David. And they decided to go ahead and start having sex, but they promised to get married. She thought, you know, God would probably be okay with that. But this to her was bad. This ruined everything. And he said that Diane just went berserk. She was screaming hysterically throwing herself all over the room, bashing her head on the walls and the floor. And this is when she started telling David that she wanted Adrian to die. To her, the only way to cleanse their marriage of this impurity was to kill Adrian. And obviously, this makes no logical sense. If you kill someone, you're not erasing what has happened, especially in the eyes of God. If that's what you're worried about, God still knows what you did, but I guess it was more about other people for Diane. She was worried about other people judging her relationship. She felt like they had to get rid of her. And David agreed. He said he was too hard to deny her anything. In fact, she said, Diane's beautiful eyes have always played the strings of my heart effortlessly. He said, ultimately, when he killed Adrian, he had no hard feelings against her at all. He just wanted to make Diane happy. On December 3rd, that Sunday night, he called Adrian and asked her to meet him outside of her house. He said, he asked her to go there around 1 a.m. He planned to pick her up and take her away from the house. Then his plan was to break her neck and drop her in the lake. And he brought weights with him to tie to her feet to make sure her body sunk. And they actually decided that Diane would join him. She hid in the back of the car. He drove out to a deserted field with Adrian in the car. And then all of a sudden, Diane pops up out of the back and attacks her. But he said that killing her was harder than he expected. He actually said in his interview that he realized that snapping someone's neck wasn't as easy as it looked in the movies. Even after being struck in the head, Adrian tried to fight back. She actually climbed out of the window of the car and ran as far as she could eventually collapsing into a barbed wire fence. According to David, Diane said we can't stop here and told him that he needed to finish the job, even though he wanted to leave at that point. But he knew he couldn't let her live. She had witnessed his crimes at this point and he would be caught. He walked over to Adrian, put his gun to her head and shot her twice. When they got back in the car, their first words to each other were, I love you. But then there was a pause and Diane said, we shouldn't have done that, David. And he wrote all of this down in four and a half page statement, signed it and turned it in. Early the next morning, 1.30 a.m., they arrested Diane who was staying at her grandparents' house at the time. She didn't ask any questions or try to deny anything. She just went with officers very quietly. The next day, she was charged with murder and held on a $250,000 bail. Diane was very obviously surprised. Uh, she didn't, she wasn't asking any questions. She wasn't making any denials. You know, she wasn't, uh, no outburst of, why are you arresting me? 
She's very quiet. After her arraignment, detectives showed her Brian's confession, which was faxed over from Colorado Springs. And she kind of took a peek at it, but didn't read the whole thing. And then they asked her if she wanted to tell her side of the story. And she said, yes. So just like David, without a lawyer present, she told her version of events to investigators. While they typed it out in a typewriter. And even though she didn't read David's confession in full, they had read certain parts of it to her. She pretty much wrote out the exact story that David had in his confession. It literally mirrored his, down to the smallest details and they knew that this is likely what happened. She explained that when she found out that he cheated on her, she went absolutely berserk. She just lost it. She talks about how she was ramming her head into the floor, over and over that night, trying to crack her skull. And then she even confessed that at some point she stood up and just looked at David and said, kill her, kill her. She felt betrayed. She wanted to get even. She told David that the only way that they could purify their love was by killing Adrian. She said the same thing. David did that the plan was to break her neck and drop her in the lake, but that didn't work out. So she had to get involved. She said that Adrian and David were fighting and it was making her mad. So she attacked Adrian in the head with one of the dumbbells. She said, Adrian stumbled back from the car after being hit in the head and tried to get away from them, but eventually passed out along the barbed wire fence. And the investigators believe that this was the true version of events. It aligned just with what David said down to every detail. And then three days later, David was arrested in Colorado Springs. He was extradited back to Texas and charged with the murder. Later, Kidnapping was also added to both of their charges, making it a capital crime punishable by death. However, Adrian's parents intervened. They said there was enough death already. They didn't want them to face the death penalty. Instead, they wanted to go for life in prison. Diane and David's friends from high school were all shocked. They had been the perfect couple, the adorable high school sweethearts who were completely devoted to each other. It just didn't make sense. Investigators ended up finding the gun and the dumbbells in David's parents' attic, which is exactly where he said that they would be. It seemed like David was going along with them cooperating, and seemed to not be putting up much of a defense until he decided that he had been coerced into giving a false confession. He said that he had been awake for 30 hours. He was exhausted, and he didn't understand how his confession would have any effect on the real world. It came to a point where the detectives were threatening, telling me that it didn't matter what I said, I was going to get the death penalty, and Diane was going to get the death penalty too, and one of the detectives said, David, just write us a story, tell us something, and we'll make sure they go easy on you. So I said, okay, here, I'll write you something. It was all so surreal. I hadn't really internalized it yet, and I guess after being awake for so many hours, you know, what I said to the police didn't, I guess I didn't see how any of that could affect my life. Soon, the national media picked up this story and it was widely reported on and dubbed the Texas cadet murder. David's confession was also leaked to the press and was used as a basis for the TV-made movie, Love's Deadly Triangle, The Texas Cadet Murder, which aired in February of 1997 before either of them even went on trial. And it was released under the title of Swearing Allegiance. Anne's beautiful eyes have always played the strings of my heart effortlessly. I couldn't imagine life without her. She'll have to suffer the consequences. She will have to die. While waiting for their trials, David and Diane were both kept in the Tarrant County Jail. They couldn't see each other, but they wrote lots of love notes back and forth. And one of the notes gave it, got quite creative when describing his love for Diane. I miss you like I miss ice cream. You're both rich and creamy, sweet and ice cold, milky and tasty and bad for you. Diane would write back saying things like, when will my love come find me? When will I get to walk out of these bars for good? I just wish I had a remote control for time. That would rock. The judge decided to try them separately, and they would both be tried as adults, even though Diane was only 17 at the time. And of course, they both pleaded not guilty. And this is where these two starts to really annoy me. They started to change their story all the time. Like it's extremely hard to keep up with it. They just go back and forth between guilty, not guilty, who's involved, who's not involved. It's so confusing. I mean, they both confess to it. And now here they are saying, they're not guilty and they're going to fight as hard as they can in trial to prove that they're not guilty. Diane's trial was first. 
It started in January 1998 in Fort Worth, and the judge actually decided to let this trial be filmed and aired on TV. Even though there had already been so much publicity and so much talk about the case, and it was kind of a surprising decision, the prosecutor's case relied mostly on Diane's confession and her confession to her roommates. All the witnesses were deemed to be reliable and would have no reason to lie on the stand. On February 2nd, they called Christina Mason to the stand who was Diane's best friend, and she provided details about the motive, David's sexual encounter with Adrian. She said, um, this is a girl they had sex with, and that they had planned her murder. Okay, and how had they planned her murder? At first, they were planning to snap her neck and drop the body in the lake, but it didn't go as planned. He also called up David's friend, John Green Jr., who testified that the night of the murder, Diane and David had showed up at his house. He said that David was calm, and he comforted Diane while she cried. The couple laid down on John's floor and went asleep. Uh, after they came out of the bathroom, uh, David was just uh, holding Diane, and she's kind of whimpering and stuff. And uh, that, they just laid down on my floor and went to sleep for a while. One of the most important witnesses was Jennifer McKinney. She was one of Diane's roommates. And she said that Diane told her that Adrian was a tramp and a slut who deserved to die. She said that the girl, everyone knew that the girl was a tramp and a slut and that she deserved to die. She said that she and David went to the funeral and that when she went to the funeral, she saw the parents and she saw how sad they were. And it made her feel very bad. Um, she felt sorry for the parents. They also had physical evidence. They had the gun. They had the dumbbells, and they also had found Adrian's blood on the passenger side of Diane's car. Then they also found something very suspicious in Diane's day planner. And this is truly unbelievable. But Diane actually wrote in her day planner what she had done on December 4th. On December 4th, at 1.38 a.m., Diane wrote Adrian and circled it. Why would that be in your calendar unless you were there? Pretty stupid. I mean, putting a murder that you did down in your day planner just like you're going to a coffee shop. But Diane's defense attorneys tried to argue that Diane was also pressured into making a false confession, and that she did it just to protect David, who was her abusive and controlling boyfriend at the time. They tried to prove that David was the dominant one in the relationship and that she was the submissive one. They brought up the fact that he called her kittens, and she called him tiger, and actually said in court that the tiger is the bigger one. Therefore, he was the dominant one, and she was a submissive on it. I don't know. It's so stupid, the whole argument. They tried to make the argument that David was abusive and controlling of Diane. They said that he would say very possessive things to her, like you are mine. No one else can have you. I earned you. I own you. You belong to me completely. There was also a lot of argument in court around the wound. Could it have been made by the dumbbell? Or was it actually just made by the butt of the gun by the one who actually did it? They tried to argue that David did both. You know, if he was one holding the gun and it was an injury made by a gun, then he probably would have done both. And if that were the case, then David would be responsible for Adrian's murder. And Diane would be a bystander and still be charged, but not as much. So they ended up making the decision to put Diane on the stand to convince the jury that all of this was true. And while she was on the stand, she admitted that she was there, but that David committed the crime and she had no involvement she was just a bystander. The only thing that she was guilty of was trying to cover up the crime. She claimed that David went after Adrian and that she just heard gunshots. Then he dragged Adrian back to the car to show Diane what he had done. Then according to her, he took her back out to the field and shot her again. Diane cried a lot in her testimony. She really struggled to get the words out. Her story changed completely from her original confession. She said she never even asked David to kill Adrian that she didn't want Adrian to die. She said she was under the impression that they were all going to just be talking to Adrian, and she just wanted to confront her. She said that she had taken blame for David to protect him and his future career in the military. Did you make him do that, Diane? <laughs> no. I asked him to, I asked him to let me meet her. Did you ever ask him to kill Adrian Jones for you? No. But the prosecution did not buy her crying act on the stand. 
and when she was cross-examined her whole demeanor changed. She seemed calm, confident, even cocky at times. Christina Mason is a liar. Oh, we found somebody. Well, is Jay Gill a liar? No, sir. I believe Jay Gill and Jennifer McCurney is interpreted a lot, and there are reasons I said what I said, but they're not liars. Christina Mason is a liar, though. She tried to say that people that testified against what she was saying on the stands were all lying, and she had nothing to do with Adrian Jones' murder. Then it was time for the jury to deliberate. They talked for six hours before they came back with a verdict. On February 17, 1998, Diane was found guilty of capital murder. We, the jury, find the defendant Diane Michelle Zamora guilty of the offense of capital murder as alleged in the indictment. She was then sentenced to life in prison with no possibility of parole until she served 40 years. Adrian's family said they were content with this verdict, with the sentence as well, but it didn't fix the pain for them at all. She meant a lot to me. And when she died, something was ripped out of my heart that will never be replaced. We can only hope that if David Graham respects his military code of honor, he will step forward and accept responsibility. Then it was time for David's trial, which began in July of 1998. And because all the media coverage around Diane's trial, David's trial was moved to New Brownfield in Texas, near San Antonio. And immediately after Diane's trial, David broke off his engagement with her. He was very upset that she got up there during her trial and pinned everything on him. He felt like now it was his turn, and he was going to tell the truth. When it came down to my defense, I wasn't going to let that, you know, crazy infatuation, obsessed relationship stop me from telling the truth. His defense attorneys tried to argue that there was no physical evidence at the scene placing David there, and that the blood evidence that was found was found in Diane's car. The only proof that he had committed this crime was his own confession, which they said shouldn't count because he was exhausted. He had been awake for 30 hours when it was given to him, and he didn't have a lawyer present. They found out that detectives told him he didn't need a lawyer. They made him believe that if he just wrote down everything that he knew, everything would be okay. To me, that statement is a product of 30 hours of, of interrogation, of false promises being made to him, of, of assurances to him that he doesn't need a lawyer and a lawyer will only confuse things. And they said the same thing that they said about Diane, that David was simply covering for Diane, trying to protect her. But the main problem with his defense is he had no alibi and wouldn't even say where he was when the crime was being committed. He claimed he met up with Diane after she murdered Adrian and that she confessed to him that did it. They argued that this confession matched the physical evidence at the scene. David claimed that he had just hidden the murder weapons for Diane and his parents' attic, trying to help her. He explained that she had some type of twisted attachment to the barbells and the gun, and that she wouldn't let him get rid of them. And throughout the trial, David seemed smug and cocky. He had this arrogant smirk on his face, and that did not go well with the jury. And then on July 15th, a girl named Wendy Bartlett took the stand. And this is big. She is a friend that drove Adrian home from the cross-country meet. David also said he drove her home from the regional cross-country meet. But Wendy was now testifying that she took Adrian home, which makes you question if David even had sex with her at all. And you're positive you drove her home on that particular evening after the cross-country meet in Lubbock? Yes. This testimony blew up the whole narrative of the case. Why would he have even killed her if they hadn't have had sex? Why would he have made that up and told Diane? And there was no proof that David and Adrian had sex. It was all just going off of his claims. Adrian's friends also testified that it was unlike her to have casual sex like that. And she knew he had a girlfriend, and she had a boyfriend. They said that her doing something like that would be very out of character for her. And no one had questioned David on his version of the story. Because without this part of the story, what would his motive for murder be? David did not take the stand during the trial. His attorney knew that the jury wouldn't believe him anyway, and letting him testify would only hurt his case. They actually only called one witness for the defense, Diane Zamora, and she just walked in there and pled the fifth. She and David made eye contact, but showed no emotion for each other. It was time for the jury to make their decision. On July 24th, the jury deliberated for eight hours before coming back with a guilty verdict. David was sentenced to 40 years in prison. 
We, the jury, find the defendant, David Christopher Graham, guilty of the offense of capital murder as alleged in the indictment. I wasn't surprised. The worst part was just hearing my family behind me start crying and having to face them after it. And shortly after his conviction, he did an interview and David said that his whole confession was a lie. He never had sex with Adrian. They were just casual friends. He said that he had given her a ride home after a few practices here and there, but they never saw each other outside of cross country. And to this day, they still deny their original confessions. They continuously change their version of events. David has seemed to adjust really well to life in prison. It seems like he actually enjoys it in there. I've adjusted to prison life a lot better than most people would, I think. I guess prison life and the military life are a lot alike, but I think in the military you get a lot more respect from your superiors. In prison, I, I guess a lot of the guards don't, you know, they don't think you're worth much. That's it for our story today. Please tell us what you think. Did they get the right sentence? Do you think he had any part of this, or was it all her? Let us know in the comments below your thoughts. Thanks for listening to this episode. We'll be back next time of course to bring you yet another case, but until then stay safe out there, and please hit the like button, and please subscribe.